Hey, how's it going, folks? It's Abdullah and Bean, and welcome back for another episode of Great Moments in Weed History. This time around, we've got another interview that Bean and I did with a progenitor of a very, very important strain in American cannabis history. We're going to be talking with AJ Sour Diesel. The AJ stands for Asshole Joe, mainly to differentiate him from a few other Joes. And also, we should note, really nice guy, Asshole (laughs) Joe, right? And also, the person most responsible for the proliferation of Sour Diesel. And he's also the first guy we've had on this show who is a true weed hustler. Isn't that right, Bean? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and we say that term with love, especially going back to this underground era when, in essence, everybody was on the hustle. Not everybody was wandering around New York City with $10,000 cash in his pocket, constantly looking for the best weed the city had to offer. But we wouldn't be where we are today without weed hustlers, and we salute them all, starting with AJ today. Yeah, absolutely. And also, let us point out that there is a distinct difference between a Chad and a hustler, right? (laughs) Chads are a bunch of like not so weedy opportunists who entered the space at its nascent legal stages to use their privilege and get ahead and take advantage, right? But a hustler is someone who holds the plant and its quality above all else, and AJ is truly this guy, who didn't just want the best weed, he wanted to hold the best weed, he wanted to move the best weed, you know what I mean? And he's really succeeded in that for his entire career. He's not the altruistic hippie, you know what I mean? He represents a different generation of cannabis person who is going around in New York trying to have access to the best possible weed at the most difficult time to handle cannabis in the city's history, right, Bean? Yeah, our story is going to start in the late 80s. That's a wild time in New York history. That's a time of extreme cannabis suppression and oppression. We're talking about the Reagan Just Say No era. And so weed is just kind of coming up from cracks in the sidewalk. He really talks about how it's a time where weed was looked down uh, by people culturally, People who were uh, into club life or heroin chic, as he t- as he describes it, were kind of looking at the weed people as dorks and losers. And this is a story of the community of people that came together to keep weed going at that time. As far as AJ being an asshole, being asshole Joe, you know, that's a name that was somewhat foisted upon him, but he learned to embrace it. He learned to have a sense of humor about it. And I think, as we're going to hear in this story, he learned a lot about himself through this multi-decade journey with cannabis. In my book, How to Smoke Pot Properly, I have the quote, weed is not the cure for being an asshole. But it's a great place to start. And I think AJ (laughs) has been on that journey. And of course, if you want to hear more about that, you can get a signed copy of that book mailed directly to you by joining our Great Moments in Weed History Patreon at the $20 level. You just have to go to Great Moments in Weed History dot com and sign up you'll get all our other bonuses at any level and that includes seeing the video version of this podcast and of course the great beautiful feeling that will come from knowing you helped support this still very independent very bootstrapped very shadow band podcast reach the people yeah absolutely you can see my extremely clean shave by the way very unusual right now also bean uh, is wearing a groucho Marx disguise <laughs> <laughs> he's just we haven't said anything about it uh is that true is it not you'll have to be a patreon subscriber to find out so please check us out great moments in weed history.com and if you don't have the bucks right now to help us make our show Please help us out by telling a friend who might be interested. Know anybody who would want to know the history of Sour Diesel? Send them a link to this show and we will appreciate you forever. Yes, I would never want to join a Patreon that would have someone like me as a member, but (laughs) don't you uh, stick to Groucho Marx's rule. We are halfway to our goal of 420 supporters that we set at the Weedathon, so please keep that momentum going. Also, uh, this 
episode fits into the larger Great Moments cinematic strainiverse. Uh, strainomatic multiverse? <laughs> Not sure. Either way, whatever works. Multimatic. Multimatic theme of verse. Uh, because Chem Dog, the strain named for the man, is a parent or a grandparent, perhaps, of Sour Diesel, the strain that we're talking about today. So it fits into this lineage, and we hope that that's really bringing into focus this larger picture of American strainology. Yes, you can check out our episode, Chem Dog Scored Some Magic Beans on Grateful Dead Lot, to get the sort of prequel to the Sour Diesel story we're going to tell today. And also, just a couple of listener notes before we delve in about some of the iconic New York City locations we're going to visit in this story. First and foremost being a club called The Wetlands, which is where AJ first encountered Sour Diesel. This is their origin story. This is their meet cute. And this is a legendary New York City club that was open from 1989 to 2001 and really was sort of the hippie, Grateful Dead, jam band bastion for the whole city in that time, a place I had a lot of fun hanging out back in my supposed youth. And this was the place in New York City that would host acts like Blues Traveler, Spin Doctors, Fish, Dave Matthews Band, Oasis, Sublime, Maroon 5, Pearl Jam, Widespread Panic, the String Cheese Incident. I mean, if you're not smelling patchouli and and maybe rolling yourself up a fatty burrito while you hear this list of names, you know, I don't know where you're at because this was the club, the center for Grateful Dead hippie weed culture. And as we're going to hear, it had a bit of a, and here's my pun for this episode, seedy underbelly. Ah, yes, indeed it did. I've never heard of any of those bands. Maybe I'll check them out after <laughs> uh, after we're done recording. Uh, and another place, very iconic cannabis place in New York that comes up in this episode is Strawberry Fields in Central Park. So this was at a time when Central Park by day was sort of this like, you know, lawless place where you could party uh, and by night became extremely dangerous, right? And Strawberry Fields in particular was a weedy corner of the park. It's, of course, named for the Beatles song. And this is extremely near to where John Lennon was tragically assassinated. And this is actually where Yoko Ono scattered his ashes. It's the site of vigils on his birthday and on the anniversary of his death. And, of course, a place to score some weed in the pre-Giuliani days of New York. Yes, and occasionally a place to score some grass clippings or <laughs> something that's <laughs> not quite. And and uh, that's the real asshole, Joe, whoever sold me uh, lawn clippings up there. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. But we're going to be visiting a very special time in New York weed history on this episode. And for that, I have a fat bowl of sour diesel packed all the way to the brim. Bean, what you got going on over there? Oh, my coffers are bare of sour diesel at the moment, unfortunately, so I rolled up this little, like, semi-pinner of everything that was collected on my rolling tray that would otherwise go to waste, so this is a little plug. Get yourself a rolling tray. It will pay for itself in recovered weed in no time. And thanks to my rolling tray, I've got this nice little fat pinner, I'm gonna call it, ready to go, but maybe you are looking down at your hands, and there's not a joint in them. You're not high. You're ready to delve into this incredible story of sour diesel with us, but you're not where you want to be in terms of elevated consciousness. Well, I've got an easy two-step plan for you. You could probably say it with me. Just hit pause and then use that time at your leisure to roll up a joint of your own, to split a blunt, to pack a bong, to stuff a bowl or to eat some edibles, whatever it takes to get you where you want to be, to get high on history with the two of us, because we promise you one thing, as soon as you hit unpause, and you're ready, we'll be ready, for another great moment in weed history. We always start these interviews out the same way. 
How did cannabis oh, first for enter your me. life? What began your relationship with the plant? In 1984, I was at a family Christmas party and my uh, I had a cousin who pulled me aside and smoked weed with me. Before that, I had uncles that smoked weed that would like take us for a ride in the back of their pickup truck and and go off-roading and, and you know, kids would be falling out of the back and they'd be laughing and smoking weed in the cab. So I knew what weed was from the time I was probably like six or seven. When did uh, really good cannabis come into your life? In the late 80s, around 1987, 88, by then, I was I was pretty much smoking weed all the time. That's when I discovered my mom had a boyfriend named Bob, who eventually she married and became my stepdad. One day, I was looking for ice cream in the freezer, and I found good weed. So then, it be, for me and all my friends when we were in high school, there was like weed, and then there was Bob's weed. So uh, we called it Bob weed. And, and what was Bob's weed? I mean, in retrospect... What were the flavors? What was the, that strain compared to in today's strain language? Today, it would probably look like shitty homegrown or like, you know, what the high end Arizona Mexican used to look like. AJ but for, Sauer, you know, for, for, Diesel, welcome to for where we were at and for that history. time, so it, was, it was Bob Weed was the shit. I kind of learned at a young age that there was a qualitative difference between, uh, you know, one weed in the next and started trying to find better and better weed. Yeah, this was the 80s. So we're talking about the Reagan era. We're talking about the Just Say No era. We're talking about a time really pre-Kind Bud in a lot of ways. Of course, there were connoisseurs and head stashes here and there. But when you're talking about the commercial cannabis available at the time, yeah, Bob Weed is probably at the at the high end. Even Bob Weed didn't have it. seeds. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow, sin Samia. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's impressive. And exactly. then exactly when did the sour diesel and where enter the equation? Well, first there was a lot of good weed around New York. Uh, once you know, eventually I got in trouble with smoking weed, and you know selling weed and doing bad stuff that you know uh, some kids do and so my parents sent me to boarding school where i was basically able it's like it was like sending someone to prison whereby i was able to build a network of other fucked up kids like me and we just got stronger it's like some wolf of wall street shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like putting us all in a room together to conspire together so uh <laughs> that's what reform school was so all the kids it reforms school who lived in the city would you know go home on you know weekends and vacations you know and we'd all you know be buying weed to bring back to sell to all the other kids there was a guy called the chief back in the early you know i want to say 1990 91 that we would call and he would sell us a gram of like real kind bud uh for like 35 dollars and- that's expensive <laughs> as fuck bro Especially for back then. I mean, I was paying like at a maximum $25 for a gram of good weed but the, but, 10, but 20 chief, years later. But you couldn't always find it. The chief was a fucking legend and you could call this motherfucker day or night anytime and he would come and sell you one gram for $35 or 10 grams for 350 It didn't matter. But but he it was always had There was no breakdown. He always had it, though. So it didn't matter. It's like you knew you were getting it. So um So for from 91, from 90 to 91, 92, the chief was uh, was huge. And then eventually, you know, I graduated high school, went on Grateful Dead tour and, you know, met a bunch of characters and and opened up a whole bunch of new avenues for for, and hanging out in Central Park, opened up a whole bunch of new avenues for finding good weed. It was sometime around 92 that I met uh, Jersey Joe. And I named him Jersey Joe because there were so many Joes around. That's the same way I became asshole Joe because there's just too many Joes <laughs> in the park. So everyone had a name, Black Joe, Jersey Joe, asshole Joe. So yeah, I met Jersey Joe in Wetlands in I think 1992. And he had the best fucking weed I'd ever seen in my life. I don't think it was Chem Dog. I think it was uh, some Northern Lights, but I immediately forged like a very close relationship with him and was like, didn't want to let him leave my site and uh, started calling him like every th- every two or three days, you know, what's going on? And it was also at Wetlands that I met the weasel who was growing Chem Dog. Me and JJ were kind of like, you know, it was like a race, you know, to get to him 
first. And there was like even, even hard feelings at times, you know, whoever saw him first. <laughs> and so, you know, we've talked on this uh, podcast a few times about Grateful Dead tour, and I think a lot of people understand, obviously, what the Grateful Dead is, but also their role in spreading cannabis, cannabis seeds, cannabis consciousness, grow advice. This was the weed internet before the internet. Yeah, there was no forums or chat rooms. There was there was Madison Square Garden and uh, and venues like that where you did your networking. And uh, I had the pleasure of uh, spending some time at the wetlands in its golden era. But uh, for people who can explain what the wetlands was and, and what made it a nexus of, of weed at that time in New York City. The wetlands was essentially a place for everyone in strawberry fields to go once the sun went down, particularly on Tuesday nights, which was Grateful Dead night. The wetlands was basically the place where you met everybody in your network, uh, at least for me and all my friends, we all met at wetlands or through wetlands somehow. And so, yeah, wetlands was just a place where you could go and smoke weed and listen to Grateful Dead cover bands. So I eventually became friendly with some of the people that worked at wetlands and somehow became an intern there and would volunteer during the day and go down there and cause they ran all sorts of environmental club programs, uh, uh, out, out of the club. It was about, saving the rainforest and you know the redwoods and all that stuff so so groups like earth first and the rainforest action network were operating out of wetlands and so i signed up and volunteered for all that stuff i was uh you know making copies during the day for them calling people reminding them about the meetings and in exchange for that i was on the permanent guest list as an intern even though i didn't you know, wasn't in school. And, and I would, uh, I had privileges. I could get free drinks. I could use the offices in the back. I could put people on the guest list. And so I basically used that as a competitive edge against guys, you know, that I was competing with because, you know, people would come into wetlands with, to sell weed. And there was like three or four of us that like, you know, we're out there looking for these people so we could buy it all. You know, back then it was like, you didn't just buy enough weed for yourself. You bought enough for you, your friends and anyone you needed to sell it to. So, so wetlands is kind of where it all started. So you're, you're spending your days in strawberry fields, which is the section of central park that's dedicated to the memory of John Lennon close to where mm -hmm. he lived at the Dakota always had a sort of, weedy, marginalized uh, Central Park back in the day uh, era, definitely a different era of Central Park. It's crazy to think about because when I lived in New York, Central Park was the last place you wanted to smoke. Yeah, you get arrested, the yeah. most dangerous one in New York City, yeah. This is pre-Giuliani. Uh, so yeah, the, the, it was a free-for-all market, basically. But it got dangerous at night. So wetlands became like a safe space to go to where you weren't going to get robbed and killed uh, after the sun went down. And this was a this was a rock club, very sort of the only bastion of jam bandery to ever really take hold in New York. Because this stuff wasn't really cool in New York. Weed wasn't really hip and cool at that time heroin was chic and like you know going to clubs like limelight and and the tunnel and bliss and and places like that that was chic and cool we were kind of like dorks that liked hippie music and weed we were kind of like considered idiots back in the day uh but uh but, but but that's what we like doing. <laughs> what were some of the bands that were coming through uh, Wetlands at that time that you know that you have good memories of seeing? The Zen Tricksters, New Potato Caboose. You know, like these were the Grateful Dead cover bands. I mean, I could go on. But then there was also like other nights where Murphy's Law would play, or um, uh. you know, Jonathan Richmond would come through, King Missile, and and and. Oh, so cool. there was like a punk and sort of new wave, like you know, like. Uh, artsy sort of alternative type music of the time. Yeah, Monday was like punk night, you know, where you might see like a hardcore show or, you know, yeah, Murphy's Law might show up. And then, you know, uh, Tuesday was hippie night. And then Wednesday, you know, it, it, it changed from night to night. But the general overall theme of Wetlands was total you know, hippie and Larry, the guy who, who started it and ran it was a total hippie. So, but they had to also 
cater to a lot of audiences in order to stay open because there wasn't a lot of us. It was a rainbow coalition of dirtbags. It was basically as long as <laughs> you much. were on the dirtbag spectrum. Yeah, as long, as long as you were a reject of society, there was a show for you one night a week, you know? And in terms of, like, the cultivation, like, you know, the, the cannabis that you're actually growing at this time, where are you growing it? How are you growing it? How are you sourcing your genetics? And what are, like, the things you're learning? Uh, also, respect for lighting a joint with a blowtorch just now. Yeah, it's my girlfriend just walked off at the lighter. She always does that. So, um, so well, uh, so I met JJ and Weasel in 92 was jocking them for any and all the weed I could get. Sometimes I would get the weed directly from the weasel. Sometimes JJ would get there first and, you know, I'd have to get it from him, but it didn't matter. You know, like we wanted that chem dog. And, and so chem dog was really the, 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 the strain that everyone was after, you know, if you, if you could get it. And uh, as you know, chem dog will, would eventually go on to, mother of the sour so it really all started there and were you aware of uh greg or chem dog the person at this time we've had him on the show so i met greg in 90 greg was learning to blow glass from a, a friend of mine named dan k <laughs> rest his soul in uh, 1993 and dan k had a school bus with a glass blowing lab on it and greg was his apprentice so yeah i met greg in 1993 at Madison Square Garden on Dan Kay's bus. It was appropriate because I was just always trying to get closer and closer to this chem dog, which I was calling the diesel. People today, I, I noticed that there's this big misconception that the day wrecker or the headband is the original diesel, but it's not. The original diesel is the chem 91 that, uh, because we didn't want to call it chem dog. Right. And what was your cultivation set? I mean, like, where are you growing weed? How many plants do you have going at this time? And, and what's like the stealth like? None, none. I'm like, uh, I'm like 19, 20 years old. I'm walking around, you know, with, with $10,000 in cash in my pocket at all times, just always looking for weed. It was the number one priority. I went places looking for weed, concerts, parks, wherever I went. I was always trying to buy weed. I wasn't growing. I was just out. I was selling a lot of Mexican weed <laughs> because back then anyone could open up a line of credit for two or $300,000 worth of Mexican weed if you knew the right people. Mm -hmm. So I would sell Mexican weed so that I could make money to buy good weed. And, uh, and then I would use the good weed to network to figure out better ways to find better sources for Mexican weed so that I could sell it and buy good weed, you know? So it all kind of like fit. There's a snake eating the tail. Well, it seems like a <laughs> lot of effort going into sourcing this weed. Why, why didn't you just use a, a an app like Weed Maps or Leafly? Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, you, I literally had to pick New York City up and shake it every day and upside down. <laughs> it fell out of its pockets. And that's, and that's what we did. And, and our intention you know, took us to all these places where we kept finding more weed. The diesel was very, was, was clearly number one, but there was also chocolate thunderfuck and hash plants and all this other good shit out there. And, you know, uh, we were crazy kids. I was, I would pay up to six, $700 an ounce if I had to. So oh I just wanted God. people, I just wanted people to know, call me, don't call anyone else. I'll pay you more for this because, you know, I, I needed to get good weed, but also it was like clout. So I could bring it back to the group of, of my friends and be like, check this shit out, you know, yeah. like, and, so, and $700 was, of early nineties money. This is, we're talking that that's, that's like by today's standards, that's like paying over a thousand dollars for an ounce of wheat. Yeah. Which people are doing today. So it's not so strange, you know, mm -hmm. I hear they might be paying 2000 an ounce in New York city for some weed. <laughs> New York city. I got to book a flight. Uh <laughs> Yeah, I got one free check, uh, one free carry-on bag. I, I, I can make a very <laughs> successful uh, uh, trip to New York. But when, when did when did that transition happen for you? From sort of well, it was it was a natural progression for me to realize. Okay, you know, like now that I've taken this leap of faith and and just dedicated my life to finding good weed at any cost, and I've seen it put to practice that. I can still sell it and make money. Like people will pay anything for this. It's a logical conclusion that I've got to start 
growing it. So that's what I did. But I was living in an alcove studio on 44th Street and 2nd Avenue in a doorman building. But uh, I decided that's this is where I'm going to start growing weed. I was already carrying like hockey bags of Mexican weed in and out of the building. And I had all the doormen on the take. Now I start carrying in dirt and buckets and, you know, fans and lights and all this other stuff. And basically started, this is before carbon filters or any of that stuff, just start growing weed with a thousand watt lamp in my alcove studio. And then I turned my, I turned my kitchen into a veg room and basically (laughs) used whatever space I had and started growing weed. And you were living there too this whole time. Yeah. So I got, I got about five weeks into flower and then I was, you know, evicted and, uh, you know, uh, got a letter from the police department saying that uh, the whole neighborhood smelled like weed and I better move right away. That was in 1995. So in 95, I decided to move up to the Catskills where, you know, uh, I could be kind of like, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. And that's where, where the, that's where I became a real weed grower, like serious about it. And wh- where were you learning the, uh, the trade? Mel Frank. I learned everything from Mel Frank and, and from trial and error. And I failed miserably at growing weed for, you know, the first two years. And, uh, and those were hard times. Now let's trace sort of your relationship to what came to be known as, as sour diesel. You encountering these strains at the wetlands, in the park, wherever you can sort of find them. But to become a grower, uh, you've got to get that magic bean. So how, how did that happen? And, and how did, did you know right away this is going to be the, the one? This is the, this is the variety that I definitely want to dig into. Well, I'll start here. In 1992, when I, when I first tried the chem dog, like the first thought that entered my mind was like, like where have you been all my life? Like, <laughs> like, I love you. That changed me because there was such a qualitative difference. The weasel uh, was putting out his stuff. He was very, very uh, shrewd and not interested in helping any of us learn how to grow weed or never would even think about giving us cuts or or seeds or anything but in 1993 or 94 in the summer i smuggled a kilo of weed home from amsterdam and so i bumped into the weasel and and he saw this really good weed i had and he was like wow i've been thinking about going to amsterdam i really got to go there and get some seeds so he went there and got some and bought some seeds a couple weeks later and started growing super skunk, started growing uh, NL5, started growing uh, Hawaiian indica and all this other stuff. So now we were getting like some different varieties from him that weren't really as good as cam dog, but you know, it, uh, but, but he was breeding with them and doing all the things he was doing. And so now seeds started slipping out. So you get an ounce of cam dog, you might get one or two seeds. And so, I got some seed, a seed of chem dog and I started growing it. The guys in Albany got a couple seeds from the weasel in their chem dog and they started growing it. And it's funny because as the years go by, I learn more and more about sour because, you know, we didn't all like share information and talk back in the day. We were all pretty quiet about this stuff unless someone was like your best, best friend. And even then, you know, like my best friends didn't know I grew weed all through the nineties, you know, they, I told them that I was buying it. You had to like, keep your mouth shut all the time and not share information. We all had different variations of chem dog that we were growing back then. It's just that sour was the one that made everybody crazy. And that was the one that like really hit. It had the right name. It had the right look, the right smell, the right taste that it just, people preferred it to everything else, including chem dog. So That's really how the sour became number one. And it was, you know, I can't, I wasn't there and I can't verify it. But one of the Albany kids claims that he actually made that cross and that the sour isn't a direct line from the weasel. It went from the weasel to upstate New York where it was crossed again and then released. We were all growing our chem varieties. I had one that I was just calling the diesel because it was so similar to the chem. And, uh, And the Albany kids were selling sour diesel right so 
Um, and I would buy their sour diesel because I could get the most money for it. So they would often come and sell it to me because I'd be like, yeah, I'll give you 6,000 or 6,400 for that. Cause I could go sell it for 96. So I would even give them 72. I think I've even paid them 8,000 before. So I got a vic- I got evicted from the house I was living in, in, in upstate New York in 1998. For growing? No. It was actually because the weasel bought the house next door to me and then his friend wound up buying my house from my landlord out from underneath me. And so I had to move suddenly. I had 30 days to get out. Wait, and was this a strategic competitive move by the weasel? Yes, we were all so competitive back then. Sour diesel is not particularly sour in its taste. So where does the sour come from? Mm. There was a bucket with a number five on it from another grow. It happened to have a five on it, right? The sour diesel was uh, actually called our diesel because that's what the Albany kids called it. But with the five in front of the hour, some guy said, what's sour diesel? And from that moment on, it just stuck, you know? So Whoa. that's and also appropriately. But because it also made everyone sour, it was the <laughs> perfect marketing term. So uh, it, 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 this, this stuff is divine. Like, it, you know, some things just, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and, so. and how, how did you, you know, like real quick before we keep going, you know, I've known you for several years at this point. I, I'm a youngster in this game, even though I'm like pushing 40 at this point. I still qualify as a youngster in this game. And ever since I've known you, you've been a really nice guy. Every time we've met, you showed me how to, uh, you know, use the crutch the long way, which is a technique that I used for a long time, and I always credit you with. Why I got that from Op- I got that from Oppie at the Katsu in Amsterdam, by the way. Ah, okay, gotcha. He, okay, so the lineage goes. He insulted back. my joint rolling prowess once and was like, "Let me teach you how to roll a joint." You clearly don't know. So uh, yeah, that was that was his tech, but. Um, I became asshole Joe just because there were so many Joes around uh, and a guy named DJ Gravy who uh, uh, is still around and is a good friend of mine. He decided to call me asshole Joe because we were kind of like very competitive back in the day. And, 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 you know, I was kind of like, I was kind of an asshole, I guess, you know, but uh, (laughs) uh, you know, I, I, I often, you know, I I could get, I, I was, we were all competing to get the good weed. And so I guess more times than not, I won, and that made me an asshole. <laughs> so when I found out that he, that 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 a bunch of people were calling me asshole Joe, or and then AJ, I just sort of embraced it rather than you know be like stop saying that. You know, I just said okay, I'm asshole Joe. That's I like that. So when I got evicted, I gave all the plants that I was holding to a guy I knew down in New York who basically swindled them away from me and pretty much uh, I never was able to get them back. And so I needed a, a, a cut of, uh, of, of diesel of your own shit. Yeah. So, uh, and the Albany guys weren't going to give it to me. They, mm. they were like, Oh fuck y'all. You don't have any diesel. Good for you. Fuck you. But I had a man on the inside who kind of like double crossed them and brought me the clones anyway. Whoa, what intrigue. Who is and this mystery man? He would never want me to mention his name or talk about him. But I will say that, but he he had gotten the clones from them to start growing. At that point, I knew how to grow weeds. So I said, sit back, buddy. Let me build this whole grow for you. And I mean, he this guy lived on a fifth floor walk up. I carried drywall and soil. I did everything for him and built this guy a, 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 a functioning great grow. And so in exchange for that, you know, we, we were good friends and he gave me the cuts. And so enter the equation like 1998. Now I get a, I get the sour. And so from that going forward from there, instead of just uh, growing what I was growing before, which was just. I was calling the diesel, which was a Kemp seed from 19, 1998 going forward. I was growing the sour. And, you know, at that point I had already been brokering it from the Albany guys. And so people were demanding it and asking for it. And so I gave them what they wanted and it became the AJ sour because a lot of those guys fell off. A lot of them uh, didn't want anything to do with the scene anymore because it had become so backstabbing and seedy and so I just, you know, I was down in New York City, far away from all that mess. You know, Jerry was dead and the scene around the Grateful Dead had kind of like 
uh, diminished. And so I developed the brand as a high end, very expensive thing that only rich people and drug dealers in New York City could afford. (laughs) <laughs> there's an element of uh of the lord of the rings ring to all of this it's it seems that precious. uh yeah there's a precious <laughs> aspect of it it doesn't seem that the energy is always so good around sour diesel but what what were some of the good things that you know aside from the money that having and proliferating this strain brought into your life um well i never I mean, to a certain extent, I was probably corrupted by it. You know, I might have been living in a delusional, spoiled world where, you know, uh, you know, if, if when you're like in your early to mid 20s and, you, you know, you, you're making an obscene amount of money, uh, uh, you know, you, it, it kind of gives you like a, like power and control over all the people around you. But I ne- I always tried to not lose myself to that. I never tried to get too big, you know. We never went above 20 lights and we always I always diversified into multiple grows and never lost my head like a lot of people did, you know. And there were people that I would build grows for cuz you know, I would someone gave me paid me enough, I'd build them a grow and I'd I'd sell them the clones and and give them an SOP. Even people in that position, a lot of people would lose their minds, you know, they would lose their head to the game and just get, you know, there was a lot of corruption and it was like the sort of Excalibur. A lot of people couldn't handle it, but I just sort of stayed in there doing my thing and uh, stayed grounded and stayed amongst my small group of friends. And most of my friends from childhood and most of my, my, like my other friends in the world, like didn't had no clue that I was even growing weed because I just wouldn't tell anyone. And so they just thought I was a spoiled rich kid who could afford to buy expensive weed and, and, you know, go on lots of vacations and, and eat at fancy restaurants every day. So it was, it was, it was like a secret society of the people who knew what I was actually doing. As you know, you're trying to sort of keep the lid on your own renown. The strain itself, sour diesel is becoming something beyond just being weed. It is It's bigger than a lot bigger than my little universe. Yeah. And when did you get a sense that that was happening, you know, all the way up to being, you know, mentioned in in rap lyrics and. and Well, I knew I knew I was like New York famous, but I didn't realize that Sour Diesel had like like the effect that it had had and that my name was attached to it, you know, thousands of miles away in places like South Africa and and California. Like I didn't this was all beyond me. Um you know, after like a, a, a crazy life of extravagance for, you know, uh, uh, a decade and a half, I kind of settled down. You know, I married uh, a, a girl who was kind of normal and didn't really understand my whole dark secret life ways. I decided I would I would open up a, a little restaurant in Brooklyn and, you know, I would I would dissolve my partnerships that I had established in grows and 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 kind of just like lay off that whole scene for a while. I guess it, uh, in 2012, a friend of mine came back from a cannabis event in California with like three different brands of seed that had my name on it. And at that time I was like doing dishes and cleaning toilets in my restaurant and like just probably at the, the lowest point of my life because I was actually doing hard work, uh, like for a living and, and not earning a lot of money. And so I realized at that point that there was something out there that I had been a part of that was huge and that, you know, it was time to stop cleaning toilets and like get back to what I was supposed to be doing because, you know, I I felt like I was hugely responsible for what was going on, yet was not being acknowledged or 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 really reaping any benefit from it. So, so I sold the restaurant and I got divorced. And I said, "All right, we're going back to (laughs) we're going back to our old ways." And that's and that's sort of what I did. Crazy. And then, can you tell us a little bit about your reentry into the game? And you happen to be the progenitor of one of the biggest strains in a world that is now made up of strains, of famous strains, right? People have these preferences. How did you re-enter the game and what are your thoughts on how it looked after you left it for a few years? 
Well, first of all, I knew the first time I tried Chem Dog that it was going to have a huge impact on the world. And I was like, this is so, so much better than everything else. And I was also, I was well familiar with the OG. I was growing a special cut of OG uh, all throughout the, the, the mid 2000s to the late 2000s for Snoop, essentially. Like just, I, he had a favorite strain that I would grow for him. And when he would come to New York, I would have it for his people which was the RBK. I saw that that Chem Dog, Sour, RBK, plants like this, OGs, were going to pretty much uh, cross themselves with everything in the future and become that. Because I'd, I always sold weed and Canadian weed and Cali weed. And I saw how chems and OGs sort of integrated themselves, how we went from like the perps to like the perps OG, or we went from, you know, sweet tooth to sweet tooth sour. Like I saw these things, you know, penetrating the mainstream cannabis markets, even though they were black markets. Yeah. That does uh, raise a point. I think we have to mention, you know, Snoop allegedly smoked weed. Uh, we don't, we definitely not during the Disney years, <laughs> not during the Disney years. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and just getting back to that, you know, th this became something that people were, were rapping about. Like, was that a big part of your direct clientele or is this uh sour spreading beyond your networks? It's, it's definitely a long way from the basement of the wetlands to, yeah. to Snoop culturally. Well, you know, I, I sold weed to a lot of celebrities and, and over the year, you know, like I, I've, but never Snoop. Yeah. But like never directly in other situations, it was always like, I had a right hand man. He calls himself Frank and he, uh, and, and he dealt with a lot of celebrities, you know, you know, the Hilton girls and all these people and, you know, the, Puff Daddy and all these people, you know, he would he dealt with a lot of entertainment industry people. And I always kept my head down and stayed far away from anything that would put me in the spotlight. And it really did become us, uh, you know, I go into my own time living in the city, working at, at high times, you know, we're starting to cross eras. It, it, it became a status symbol at, at a time that, you know, there was really like weed, good weed. And then Chem and Sour D, at least in New York City. And it was something that if you were out socially and you were with people, and even if they were casual weed people, all you had to do was open the bag. And that the intensity of the smell, the specific You didn't even have to open profile. the bag, yeah. yeah. You, just had to, <laughs> you just had to walk by. <laughs> well, if I'm assuming the bag was vac uh, vac sealed. And even then, sometimes. Yeah. If you touched it, it was on your hands all day, yeah. And so now that process of coming above ground, you know, being able to talk to us on a podcast and what you're doing now, um, take us through that journey and up, up to where you are uh, at in your weed life right now. In 2014, when I first started going to like High Times events and Cannabis Cups and stuff like that, I was not convinced that everyone I met wasn't a fed and that I wasn't about to get arrested. So I yeah. was kind That's of like... That's where we all met, incidentally. There's a photograph of the three of us and Jason Pinsky uh, <laughs> at the Cannabis Cup. I thought... Ja I was convinced Jason Pinsky was working for the feds, too. I was like, is this all real? <laughs> Come on. I got friends in jail right now. No one's letting them out. How I, I can't talk mm -hmm. about this stuff. But, you know, you know then I moved out. To Colorado and then California and now you know now I don't really think much of it you know I'm like put the joint down there's a cop on uh, next to us you know but I'm not I'm not paranoid like like it paranoia was yeah super, super heightened back in the day security was everything all right so you know today where can your average person find the legitimate AJ Sour Diesel and not one of these mimicry knockoffs that are floating around all over the world. Well, first of all, the cuts are the cuts are out there. I sold cuts and gave cuts to people throughout the years and they've definitely been out there. But there's also been so many imposter cuts, so many knockoffs, you know, that are related or not related. And uh, there's been a 
lot of confusion. And what makes it, I think, even more confusing is that I'm probably not using this word correctly, but I'll use it anyway. Uh, the sour is what I always say. It's polygenomic, meaning that it can it's, it can genetically express itself in a multitude of ways, depending on how you grow it. Even if someone had a real cut of sour, it might not meet the expectations of someone who remembers it from back in the day the way we did it. And the plant is so dynamic that, you know, perhaps the sour that you guys were smoking back then, perhaps it's frozen in time. And actually, we're never going to have the exact same conditions that deliver that same flavor, that same experience, right? You know, people work things up in their head. But look, the sour, you if you were around at that time, you know, it's not just hype in your mind that 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 there, the sour was magic. But and is magic if you can still recapture what that was. But we're also, today we're using different lights. Even if you were to go out and buy the same exact fertilizers and, and everything to try and recreate exactly the way you did it, uh, chances are you're, you're not using old magnetic ballast, high pressure sodium lights. The, even the fertilizer companies that were around back then have changed their formulas and like nothing is ever going to be exactly uh, the same, but I get it to come pretty damn close. And when people see it, they're usually pretty, they're like, there it is, you know, but also I don't produce it every two months anymore because I just, I don't need to, you know, I mean, I, I, like I said, I'll grow weed once a year and then I'll just sit back and smoke it. So if I show you the sour I'm smoking right now, well, I cut it down last July. So maybe that, that, that smell and that taste isn't going to hit the same way, you know, mm. weed ages. That sounds like the only reliable way to really experience the true sour D is to step into a hot box time machine and go back to the 90s, go back to the early 2000s. But the legacy of the strain, the legacy of your work clearly goes on. We smoke on the shoulders of giants, and that doesn't just go back to your work. That goes back, as we always say on this podcast, hundreds and even maybe a thousand years of cannabis breeding. So, Cherish the incredible strains that you're able to get your hands on right now. Enjoy these trips back with us into weed history and, yeah. you know, maybe squirrel a little something of your favorite away in a jar for a rainy day because uh, cannabis times and people change. Yeah. But, and, and if you're at, in the right place at the right time, you might just see some real sour diesel. Ah, we <laughs> should be so lucky. To ever have that experience well joe aj sour diesel legendary cannabis cultivator thank you so much for being on great moments in weed history and sharing your story thanks guys right thanks guys right thanks guys right thanks guys right thanks guys